Um, yeah, thank you, Rose, for a great presentation, Jeff, for introducing me. Um, and I also wanted to uh, thank the folks at Brown for welcoming me uh, into the space. Um, I'm really excited to be here uh, and to share and to get to know more what you guys are working on and the kinds of knowledges that are being produced in the community around the COVID Institute. So I thank everyone um, for welcoming me. Um, yeah, I, I had made a proposal initially for a mostly conceptual presentation uh, to be in line with the theme of political concepts. And I was going to sit with the Althusserian concept of transition and attempt to rethink it from the positionality of transgender bodies and in the spirit of the, this Marxist political concept, I ground this rethinking on the specific conjecture of the pandemic, which hereby identifies a period of transition that there I remind us is not over. Um, but yet against structuralism and with its important critiques coming from the legacy of feminism, I ground my thinking geopolitically within the international division of labor. So in a way I could say somewhat ironically, but also already putting us into the works that this has been overdetermined by my body. So what I mean is that I cannot speak meaningfully about transition without speaking to the place that I come from, which is Lima, Peru. So being a trans person from Lima overdetermines my relationship to Marxist structuralism in the sense that, stru that structuralism comes into Marxism as a way of interrupting historical thinking by way of structural thinking. And speaking Marxist tongue for me is putting on a sort of macho drag. Because after all, I mean, Althusser killed his wife, Marxist sociologist Helen Reitman. And, and, and having this in mind, I mean, a feminist critique of this specifically French contribution to Marxism after Gayatri Spivak would have to ask why this structural thinking is not usually grounded geopolitically. Um, I stress again that the pandemic is not over because in Peru, hundreds still die by the day and it is only escalating. So I wanted to ground the talk in my central objective, uh, which you can find in the conference website, um, that the hope is that a feminist analysis of transition can orient us toward the significance of thinking through a transition while still living within it. And, and flagging its potentialities in the form of political strategies as always aligned with our ever-changing perceptual limits. Um, so acknowledgement of our perceptual limits is important here. And here I want to start with a video that was taken by a Peruvian police officer during the first lockdown in April. Now we're in the fourth lockdown, just for you to have an idea. Uh, under the former president, Martin Vizcarra, who got impeached last year and who followed Pedro Pablo Kuczynski's impeachment the year before, a story <laughs> I saved for another time. Um, he implanted a measure of gender apartheid in public space with the dangerously naive intention of reducing the number of people in the streets. So specifically, weekdays were divided in two so that each of the two genders could circulate separately. Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays were for men, and Tuesdays, Thursdays, and Saturdays for women. You might find this insane, but it was actually implemented not just in Peru, but also in Panama and the city of Bogota. Uh, and in the latter, actually, it was implemented by Mayor Claudia Lopez Hernandez, Latin America's first ever lesbian mayor. So, so much, at least out, no? So, so much for our presentation. Um, but the video I'm about to show, uh, and this is functions as a bit of a content warning as well, uh, is of three trans women that were taken to the commissary by the police for circulating on the wrong day. I remind you that there is still no law that allows someone to change their gender and their legal documents and no law protecting trans people in general. Um, this video went viral and I choose to show it through the account of Feminas Peru a trans woman led NGO so that you're aware they exist. And in the video, the policemen are harassing them, not touching them, but making them squat and repeat after them, I want to be a man, quiero ser un hombre. So these are officials of national security who are 85.5 responsible for the violence towards trans women, according to the survey conducted by the NGO formerly known as No Tengo Miedo. Uh, during the pandemic, they changed their name to Rosa Rabiosa, a story that also served, saved for another time. 
Um, so I'm going to share the video here. It's very short. Fuerte mierda, fuerte. Fuerte. Y cuando monté, por si acaso. Quiero ser un hombre. Más fuerte, los tres juntos. Quiero ser un hombre. No escucho nada. Quiero ser un hombre. Señor, no puedo ir mi cuerpo, te consigo. Señor, me te cansa. Quiero ser un hombre. No escucho nada, tú, el de medio. Quiero ser un hombre. Tú, de rojo. Quiero ser un hombre. Un hombre quiero ser. Un hombre quiero ser. Okay. If there's anything you didn't hear or any technical mistakes, please just talk over me to let me know. Um, so yeah, in in Peru, the gender separation measure lasted only eight days, um, not because of the series of videos that surged from discrimination of trans women, but because the lines in the supermarkets were much longer during the days that were design designated for women, which still are clearly in their majority in charge of domestic tasks like the purchase of food, cooking, and cleaning. The database failed. It proved itself, even in the eyes of the state, as too archaic for its own society. The cop filmed from above, also asserting archaic forms of authority. It is hard to know what the policeman's hope behind their rancid schoolyard class and conditioning technique was. The women chuckled. I imagine that partly out of nervousness and partly because of how nonsensical the demand they were asked is. In any case, the laughing functioned as another resignification, making ridiculous the premise of declaring in their bodies and with their voices that they want to be men. They repeated as the cop behind the camera aggressively demanded that they speak louder as he was saying, I don't hear anything. Of course, he will not hear anything until the voice that comes out of one of them fulfills their idea of masculinity and pronouncing itself out loud with the familiar military intonation that they were expecting. But the women never gave him the pleasure of such a performance, even as the cop referred to them erroneously with masculine pronouns and forced them to repeat the phrase. Near the end, one of them said it with a deliberately feminine intonation which made all of them burst into laughter. Protected by each other's laughter, they formed an acoustic defense together, granting the phrase an unmistakable irony. Had it been intonated in its purely literal meaning, the result would have been much more painful. A change of mood would have led to a loss of dignity, or if I am allowed, existence. In her book, Capital is Dead, Is This Something Worse?, Mackenzie work suggests the following, and I quote, perhaps it is as hard to describe transition between modes of production as it is to describe changes in mood. The cop could not, even for a second, fully, fully maintain his authority, not even as he captured the scene of subjection. Where did the space of laughter come from? What grounds this transition between fear and irony? These are in many ways and after Althusser ideological questions that as such, are tied up with political economy in meaningful ways. By ideology here, I mean nothing too complicated in the sense that it refers to the very air we breathe. In the words of Althusser, it is a system of representations. I'm gonna quote, human societies secrete ideology as the very element and atmosphere indispensable to their historical respiration and life, end of quote. In the case of the video, the laughter, the mood exchange between fear and irony comes from a healthy combination, as it were, between the lack of respect to authority, a contemporary cosmopolitan common sense, and a sort of sixth sense of survival that trans folk have very well trained. The lack of respect to authority is a cultural practice in Peru rooted in a historical distrust of political authorities and people in power due to our long tradition of explicit corruption and governance already dating 500 years. And I'm referring to the time of colonization. The cosmopolitan common sense that I'm speaking of comes from an urban daily surfer of the World Wide Web sensibility that perceives this gesture of imposing a gender on an adult as straight up dumb, if not old fashioned. About the sixth sense, at the end of the day, citations and appropriation are a central element of so-called queer culture. Our spaces of visibility are born from the dandy, the camp, what Susan Sontag described as what sees everything in quotation marks. From the perspective of the body, a change of mood makes all the difference in the meaning of the words uttered. 
It marks the line between what one is and one isn't. Humor is historically the space of empowerment for dissidences. Voice intonation in this case is what arbitrates the real meaning of the words. A series of small debts between being or not a man, between being a man and not being a man, between existing as such in the other's eye and denying that existence with our voice. Fighting the eye with the voice intonation is one among many quintessential strategies of gender transition, which must be stated doesn't go from A to B. F to M or M to F do not refer to end goals, but a permanent state of transitioning. This can be felt in the video in the way these women still have to constantly negotiate their womanhood. In considering, though, the circulation of the video, we can understand an important way in which a body in permanent transition can inform political economy. So putting it somewhat flatly, Althusser thinks of transition as a matter of perspective. His main structure is well known to some. It consists of three instances. The economic, which refers to what Marx calls the social relations of production. The political, mostly in relation to forms of governance like the nation state. And the ideological, which as implied is closest to the body in an immediate way as it pertains the senses and transverses all aspects of living. So transition, hold on, yes. Um, so transition is a perspective that allows us to see the uneven development of these, how several models and combinations of economic, political, and ideological configurations coexist. For Mackenzie work in our unperceptible transition from capitalism to something worse, what's at stake is precisely ideology, what she calls our poetry, that is among other things, the language we use to speak of ourselves. Her central strategy in this book is the acknowledgement of a new form of class struggle in the era of political economy of information. In her poesies, we have the hacker class that produces free information and opposes itself to the victorial class that mobilizes and monetizes this information. So the victorial class controls the structural terms of the information and grants to others the right of its property. There is a whole political economy that runs in the symmetries of information as a form of control, she writes. Information here being understood as something that is only possible when there is, quote, a material substrate of matter and energy to store, transmit, and processes. For instance, for those of us that have MacBooks and are connected here through our MacBooks, the gold in the chips comes from Peru. So it's a direct link in the economy of information is very material. So information, in other words, has a body. In its process of production, we have a cyborg that can be more or less delineated. Trans face and voice computer software meeting or trans bodies and voices, cops, cell phone facilities. The circulation of this information is a constant reincorporation to the ultimate point of abstraction, which is data. That is more or less when information becomes property. A series of reincorporations separate the two classes, the hacker from the vector. Class identity gets recentered as a relation not with work, but with property. In this case, for most of us, it, it is the case for most of us that our body gets transfigured into data, but only a few are the owners of this data. Therefore, only they can mobilize it to their pleasing, at least to a certain extent, configuring it, selling it to the highest bidder, be it a corporation or a state. Some bodies endure this process of transfiguration into data better than others, or else only some have the privilege of feeling represented. Most of us don't know who or what manipulates our information or how exactly it is processed towards a certain database. We don't know how they see and catalog us what filters distill us nor what parts of us go unnoticed. This matters little at the time of feedback that is the moment where the database get reflected back into our lives in the form of necropolitics. Because biopolitics, the biopolitics of some is at bottom the necropolitics of others. How many have been killed in the name of the common good? The National Police Peru affirmed on Twitter that the two officers responsible for the video were separated for serious misconduct. This, I assert, is not out of the goodwill of the police or the state. The policemen were punished not because they harassed trans women, but because they filmed it. 
they were punished for circulating information that clearly did not belong to them, even if, according to some, they were the authors. In our economy of information, the base strategy of the victorial class is to dissociate authorship from property. As Wark writes, if you are getting your media for free, this usually means that you are the product. If the information is not being sold to you, then it is you who are being sold. If the channels of circulation fail the police, this is because the infrastructure of communication escapes the state. The Peruvian state, which gave the police by law the power to catalog bodies in the street and mobilize them as property, was not counting with the supralegality of the victorial class. The power of the victorial class overflows the state since we are talking about a cosmopolitan network by excellence that knows no borders nor demands them existing thus above the law. What they inhabit is actually a wild zone of power in the words of Susan Buck Morris, which is intrinsic to the democracy of masses. What we think of as the democratization of information then is actually the commodification of existence. How could the Peruvian state ever compete with Facebook or Twitter? The casual alliance between the movements for trans right and the state run justice system, because the policemen were fired after all, can be taken to a critique of visibility or more explicitly what Tourmaline, Eric A. Stanley and Joanna Burton call the fundamental paradox of representation. Visibility and violence go hand in hand or else the struggle for visibility and the struggle against brutality, police or otherwise, are inextricable from one another in a transgender body. The binary visibility, invisibility is grounded in the eye of capital. The eye of capital, or to give it more embodiment, the eye of patriarchy, that which sees the world from the perspective of hegemonic masculinity, a specific kind of masculinity that with Sylvia Winter has historically enjoyed overrepresentation. This is because the very infrastructures of visibility as those of violence are overdetermined. It's all being surveilled, but totally misread. Ours is the steering power, but only when realizing what our real alliances are. The women making longer lines at the supermarket are the reason why the gender apartheid law was suspended. This prevented many trans women from getting harassed by the police and proved that the fight for trans right is deeply linked with women's rights. Analogously, the hypervisibility or excessive and excessive violence towards trans women is also bound to the invisibility of trans men. The database of the state has no numbers on trans men whatsoever. The patriarchal eye only knows how to see a particular construction of the women. For the remainder of my time here, I want to put visibility in suspension by considering one last image. The image I will close with comes from the catalog of an exhibition that opened for only three days at the Museum of the Universidad de San Marcos, the largest public university in the country and oldest in the continent. Titled, This Too Shall Pass, the exhibition is of a series of photos by Sandra Salazar, a Peruvian artist mostly known for his paintings and drawings. The photos span three years and were made in collaboration with five other trans guys from Lima. The one pictured is from a series titled Dairon. In it, we see Dairon on a bed wearing an open button down shirt and with no pants, with his legs spread open with Salazar's canvas acting as a background. I bring attention to the show because of its transgressiveness. Nothing like this has ever been shown by any art institution in the country, much less a public university. The museum actually decided to not reopen the show ever using the pandemic as their excuse. The only trace left of such an attempt at the occupation of public space in the form of self-presentation of trans masculinities is the cuadernillo where the image can be found and from which I screenshotted it. So now I'm gonna share my screen. Um, this is, this is Dairon. I'm gonna, for the sake of time, sharing is, oh, okay, good. So I'm gonna stop sharing now. Um, it is still an open question whether the museum does not want to take responsibility for the images or whether it is just indifference. As much as it remains a question whether you could see Dairon's genitals or not, or whether you saw them as such. 
For trans guys, the enhanced clitoris can be a familiar sight. We would like to ask him, where did you get your tea? Was the test of iron, yeah? How do you make a living? Did they ask you for your documents? What did they do when they found out? Did you get fired? The photograph screams for visibility, but different eyes see different things. A particular uncertainty of what is actually being seen is specific to trans masculinity. Would we have read in the headlines, transgender students protest against the threat of censoring at the exhibition. This too shall pass, the exhibition that broke silence around transphobia in Peru. How an exhibition in San Marcos catalyzed a debate about gender education in the public school circles. Photography show exposes the health sector to the reality of transgender people in Peru, and this is the result. Know the reason why these public functionaries demand inclusion politics for the transgender population. Art is political. Debate in a public program of the exhibition, This Too Shall Pass, is taken to the Palace of Justice. This was always real, but the new millennium makes it evident. Dissident life enters the public eye through the black market, and at the same time, the very desire for dissidence is channeled through the means of communication that are indissociable from it and from mass culture. In Peru, trans bodies are blasphemy, literally. Mass culture does not belong to us as it is profoundly censored by the colonial Catholic heritage that is impossible to depenetrate. The church saturated all means of communication and of legislation. And at the end of the day, the market is one more channel for respiration and paradoxically, it is often the only means of resistance. What transvincibility in the hands of trans people in Peru communicates here is the irreducible informality of the transition, because it is there in the informal market where our invisible minority survives through silent alliances with the majority of the country. This apparent benefit of the flux of subalternity is nevertheless knotted up with a socioeconomic structure that is profoundly paralyzed. Transition is normally associated with mobility, but being transgender in Peru presupposes a class stagnation. For the privileged classes, being trans is betrayal, a renunciation letter. For the working class, it, is, it means losing your job and dramatically increasing your risk of death. Statistics are only missing, but it is not a secret that many transgender women live from sex work and now in the pandemic donations. And that trans men that pass as cis constantly look for ways of being hired without getting their IDs checked. Being on binary. Have, yeah. Hi. Uh, we'll have to wrap up shortly. So if you yeah, could. I have okay. one. Thank you. Um, yeah, I have one paragraph left. Um, I just wanted to say that, yeah, the fragile, the fragile autonomy is also given by internationalist alliances. And our current practice of gender dissidence is indissociable from the infrastructure of the internet, the monopoly of U.S. based media companies and the visibility forward content produced by the U.S. empire. Um, and U.S. imperialism in general is something that all Peruvian dissidents must position themselves in relation to and many. Um, and so in many ways, I wanted to conclude with a series of links. Uh, that you can choose to donate to. Um, these are three trans folks that are active in the circles um, and their PayPal's. Um, I don't know how to panelists and attendees. I'm just sharing their um, donation links. Thank you.